All right, welcome. We are here with Lolly Daskal, and she is the author of the new book, The Leadership Gap. And I'm really excited that we have her uh, here talking live to recognized expert course participants and, uh, and also uh, recorded to the world. <laughs> so Lolly, thanks, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Dory, for having me. Awesome. So, okay, first, so I, I'm going to ask you a million questions uh, related to all, all the different stuff that you do, but of course, uh, and also take questions as well from our course participants, but just to get things kicked off and warmed up, the obvious reason that we're here is your book. So can you tell us a little bit about the leadership gap? What I, I have read your book, so I am, I am fully aware of it, but other people might not have because as, at the time that we're recording this, it has not officially been released yet. What do you mean by the leadership gap, and what, uh, who, who is the book for? What, what, uh, what job does it do? Those are so many questions. If, so those, many. Those were six questions. So let's Sorry. Start. <laughs> the first question. I think I'm going to get it right. The first question, right? It's called the leadership gap, what gets between you and your greatness. What have I found in the three decades that I've been working with leaders around the world, I have found that within us, we have a polarity. There's a part of us that either can lead us to greatness and there's a part that can lead us to our gap. What is a gap? A gap is when we feel stuck. A gap is when we're not taking ourselves to the next level. A gap is anything that you feel that you are not living your potential. Now, who is this book for? This book is for every single person that is breathing. Why? Because even though it's called the leadership gap, I believe that we're all leaders. My definition of leader is anybody that's making an impact, anybody that's making, that's having influence on another, anybody that if someone comes to you for advice, you are a leader. And so the leadership gap talks about how you can stand in your greatness, how you can live your potential, and to be very mindful of your gaps so you can learn to leverage them in order to be as successful as you want to be. Boom. I love it. So Lolly, I know from your description and also because, you know, I know you, uh, the, 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 the book is kind of inspired uh, to a certain extent by Jungian archetypes and the Jungian view of the world. Can you talk a little bit? I mean, maybe, maybe you could take like, like just, you know, because I know that there are seven types, maybe like just one or two and give some examples of what the archetype is and, and also how the dark side kind of fits into that as a leader so people can begin to understand how the, how the uh, sort of uh, formula works. So let's talk about what is an archetype. An archetype is a persona that all of us have the same behaviors. We have the same traits. It's something that we have in common. So we have things that are great about us, what we call light. And as Jung calls them, we have shadows, things that end up costing us in our greatness, costing us in our success. So what I've done is I've created seven archetypes that I have found that exist within all of us. We're not one and we're not another. We're all of it. It's the sum of all our parts. But we have to be very mindful of the polarity because that's where it makes the biggest difference. So let's take the navigator, which I really like because I think it pertains to your audience. So the navigator is someone who's very smart. They're very practical. They're very pragmatic. Those are the people that usually start businesses because they know how to solve a problem. They see something and they want to be able to fix it. But the navigator's biggest gift is, is that they know how to empower people. They empower people by not telling them what to do, but they show people what to do. And so what happens when you stop showing people and you start telling them, you are starting to lead from your gap and you end up being the fixer who comes across as arrogant. The fixer is someone that says, oh, you have a problem. Oh, you need this answer. Oh, you have a crisis. This is what you need to do. This is how you need to do it. And they don't really listen to their tribe, to their audience, to their customer, to their clients. And they keep telling them what to do instead of being silent, instead of listening, they're telling. And because that is true, most of the time they come across as arrogant and a fixer. People want to stop doing business with them. People want to stop associating with them. And so this ends up costing them in their greatness. So that's the way we can see one leads us to what we want and one leads us away from what we really want. 
That's fantastic. Thank you. So when we were talking a, a moment ago before the recording started, you mentioned that in promoting this book, you have done 200, or yes, 200 podcast interviews. Now, when I launched Stand Out in 2015, I did 160. And so clearly you had to, yeah, you win. <laughs> you are a superstar. <laughs> but I get asked all the time, people say, oh my gosh, how did you get 160? So I will ask you, how, you know, many, many of our uh, students and listeners are interested in trying to break into podcasts. How did you find these podcasts? How did you approach them? How, how did you manage to land 200 interviews? And I always start, when people always ask me, I always say the same thing. Dory Clark was the first person that said, oh, you want to do podcasts? And you gave me a list. You had a starter list. Now, did everybody answer me on that list? Absolutely not. I had to go find like-minded people. So if on your list was 10 people that said yes, I had to do a search. Who was like-minded, like these individuals that I could pursue? And then that's what I did. And I wrote a letter and I said, oh, sometimes I even said, Dory, can I use your name? And you said, absolutely, you were so gracious. So the folks that you can use somebody else's name was brilliant. But the folks who didn't know me, I tried to sound so passionate about what they were doing, not what I wanted, what they were doing, and how I would like to come on and have a conversation and see if I could serve their audience. And that was my little hook. It wasn't about, oh, I've got a book and you need to interview me. It's like, I love what you're doing, but I want to be of service to your audience and do you think I could be on your podcast? And it worked nine times out of 10. That's great. How did, how did you research them, Lolly? How, how did you sort of dive into figuring out what they were about to see who was like-minded? So I have a book that's coming out now in May, and I started this process in November of 2016. And so I you gave yourself a good six months, six, seven months. A long time, right. But I also gave myself a good eight weeks where I spent every single day, an hour, just looking through iTunes, what were the number, what were the top 10? Okay, if the top 10 don't say yes to me, what are the top 20? What are the top 30? And then I did something smart. I'm gonna tap myself on the shoulder. Do it. So certain a podcast that I really wanted to get on, I even said this, I'm writing an article for Inc. and I would like to write about you. Can you would you wanna be part of the article? And then can you tell me about who you are and what you do and what's different about your podcast? And once the article, you know, hit 1,000, 200,000, 300,000 views, they were like, oh, wow, we have a lot of people coming on our podcast. And then I said, well, would you consider having me on your podcast? And I didn't do it that way, but it was a way, a vehicle that I was giving something first before I received something. So it was research. It was making connections. It was asking everybody that I know, do you know anybody? And once I was on a podcast, I said, can you recommend me to other podcasts? So that was a little bit of my system of what I did. Fantastic. I, I love that. Um, that's really helpful. So um, you mentioned writing for Inc. That, that is one of the, the pieces of your platform. You are, uh, in fact, one of the most popular writers for Inc. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about how, how did you start writing for them and what have you learned about crafting articles that really resonate and get so many views and so many shares? So last month, I, was, I had the top three articles on Inc. That means you have to have a million and above. So Yes, I am one of the top writers, but it didn't start out saying I want to be one of the top contributors. But I like to do systems of what I do. I like to make everything that I do into a process so that it gives me the freedom to do the things that I like to do. So when I write an article for Inc., and I found this to be true across many platforms, except for Harvard Business Review, which I, but I found this to be true for Entrepreneur, Business Insider, Inc., Huffington Post, is that if I can keep it short, if I could keep it that every sentence could stand on its own, could be inspirational, I would have a winner. Now, this is my secret sauce that I'm sharing with your audience, is that every paragraph is, is as important as the whole article. Sometimes people write and they write long articles and they write a thousand words per article. I don't write more. My blog posts are 350 characters, 300 words. My, I think ink goes up until 600 because 350 is too short. 
but I try to make that every article, people walk away and say, I can do this. This is for me. She's only talking to me. How did she know me? And I try to make it personal. And I try to care about the people that will be reading the article so they feel inspired and they feel motivated. So that's my little secret sauce. I like it. Thank you. That's, that's great. How long have you been writing for Inc? And w- like from, from the start, were you getting huge amounts of shares or was this something that kind of built up over time? Great question. So I didn't wake up one day and decide, I want to write for Inc. I had a blog post. I had a blog. I had, I was writing for Huffington Post and I was tweeting and my social media reach was very large. And I was at a party at Inc. one afternoon. I think someone, a friend of mine was um, promoting his book or something, I don't remember. And someone around the table said, we need contributors. But one of our top contributors, and they named who he was, he is the best at Inc. He's the best. And I'm a very competitive person. So I was like, I want to be the best on Inc. And so I asked, are you looking for contributors? I have 1.2 million followers. I have 20 million on LinkedIn. I I can get the word out. And they said, oh yeah, we want you to write for us. And so the first thing I did was study the top contributors at Inc. What did they do? What did they write about? How did they formulate it? And then once I studied and researched it, I then said to myself, how can I make it my own? You don't want to copy what they're doing, but you want to take who you are and make it even maybe better or as excellent as what they're doing. And so I studied the five top contributors and I formulated what people were clicking, what they were interested in. And then I started to write. I didn't actually start to write articles. I started to create an Excel spreadsheet of conversations that I was having with other people. If people were coming to me and saying, I'm suffering from confidence, I wrote down, okay, 10 ways to have confidence. Oh, I wanna become an influencer, five ways to become an influencer, 10 ways to become the best networker. Whatever people were talking to me about, I started to write an Excel spreadsheet. And then I created that secret formula where I care about the people I'm talking about, I want them to feel motivated and inspired, And before long, I think it took like three to four months, I became their number one contributor. That's fantastic. I love it. Um, David had had a quick question. He just wants to know, how do you figure out who the top contributors are? Is there like on Inc, does it say like the top, here's the top contributors or how did you know? David, great question. So every writer, every contributor within Inc has a platform that they're allowed to be, it's like it's behind the scenes. And you can see who has the top article for the day. And at the end of the month, they send out a newsletter to every single person who contributes and says, these are the top 10 articles for the month. And I have been in the top 10 ever since I made it. I think it was three months after I started. Ah, okay. So, so knowing the top contributors was something, it's intel that you get once you're a contributor. But if, you, if you're coming at it from the outside, if you're saying, okay, I want to pitch ink, I want to you know, know who's popular, um, is, is there a place to go where you can just see the, like, the, the top articles or what would you recommend? I, was, I had lunch with Derek Halpern, I think it was two weeks ago. And I know I'm not doing a service here, but I promise I will get the name of the URL. He said to me that he knew all my top articles by going to this one website. So I don't remember what the website was, but I will tell Dory afterwards and they'll have Dory then put it into the show notes. But there is a website that you can go on and find the top articles of all ink and entrepreneur. It tells you the number, it tells you how many views, it tells you everything you need to know. I think it's a paid URL. I think you have to pay for the service. Okay, well, we'll we'll loop back on that. That's great. So I'm starting to get some questions into the chat box, which is which is great. And so we we tackled David's and then some other folks, Evelyn and Lori, have uh, have put in uh, their questions. So I will first of all just open it up to everybody. Um, we want to make we have Lolly until 7:40, and we want to make sure that this is your time. I asked the initial questions to get the ball rolling, but please type in your questions and we'll get them. And so I'll just start from here. So Evelyn uh, wanted to know, Lolly, she said, before Inc., and even before Twitter or the Huffington Post, how did you get, how did you get your start? How did you initially you know, get clients as an executive coach? How did you start building your platform in the early days? 
So Evelyn, that's a great question. First of all, by the way, I never said I wanted to be a writer. Being a writer and being a thought leader was an evolution of what I was doing. So when I first started out, I know there's a saying that you teach what you need to learn, right? And so in the very, very beginning, I was teaching uh, little workshops on personal development. I was teaching meditation and I was teaching all kinds of modalities that um, would help me find myself. And it was in one of those workshops that a participant came over and said, you know, Lolly, I have a problem at my business. And the first thing Evelyn that came to my mind was, why is he talking to me? I don't know anything about business. You know, I'm this like personal development guru where I know everything about how to find yourself and self-development. And he started to talk to me about his business, but then I decided to do something that I do very well. And I think Dory does it also very, very well. Actually, I know Dory does it very well. I'm very, very good at asking questions, open-ended questions. And so I started to ask him questions. What I call in my book, the, actually the navigator. A navigator is very good at staring through a problem, guiding through a problem, but they don't actually fix it, right? So I was standing with this person and I was asking him question after question and he kept coming up with answers for himself. And at the end of the conversation, he goes, you know, Wally, I feel really empowered. I like what we just did. I want you to come and join my company, but I'm going to call you the fixer. And I was thinking, I'm not the fixer, I'm the navigator. But anyway, he brought me along to walk, work with him in his company, and he loved the results that he was getting. He actually recommended me to other clients and other people, and I'm going to date myself now, but there was an old commercial, a Breck commercial that went, and so on, and so on, and so on. So everything that I've ever done has been a word of mouth and recommendation. So this is the most important thing I learned of that small opportunity that every encounter is an opportunity. Every interaction is an opportunity. So we can't think, I don't deserve to be here, or I'm not worthy enough, or smart enough, or good enough. Just show up to the best of your ability, and guess what, three decades later, you could be an executive coach having your own business consulting firm. Very cool, Lolly, I love it. And so, so that, that talks a little bit about how you got into executive coaching. One of the things that I think is an interesting facet of your story that I think is, is just worth touching on is you have a very large Twitter following. Uh, you were an early adopter to Twitter, which kind of ties in with that. Maybe you could talk a little bit about it. Like, how did, you, how did you discover Twitter? How did you build such a large following? Because, I mean, these days when we think of people who have a million plus Twitter followers, it's usually someone who's a, a pre-existing celebrity, uh, like a football player or a, or a musician or something like that. But you as a civilian were able to build this. Um, so maybe you could talk a little bit about how that worked. You mean I'm not a celebrity, Dory? Oh, to me, to me you are. <laughs> okay, so that's a fair question. The first thing that brought me to Twitter was the sense of curiosity. I've always been extremely curious about everything. I'm always looking on the internet for what's new, what's current, what's the next step? What, what, is, what is something that we can do that I haven't done yet before? And so that brought me to Twitter. When I first joined Twitter, trust me, I had no clue what it was. It's the same thing even with Medium. When I started writing for Medium, people were like, what's Medium? And so I'm always looking for things that are new and current to stay one step ahead of what everybody else is doing. So on Twitter, when we first joined, it's actually a funny story. The only thing we did on Twitter was talk about Twitter. What is Twitter? How do you use Twitter? Who should we tweet? And it was like, it was, it was a very small conversation, a very small conversation. And it didn't, I don't know if people remember this and I don't know if it's still true, but you could only hit a certain plateau at Twitter. You had to like 200, I think it was, tw uh, I think it's 2000. And then you had to have the algorithm of people following you. You couldn't get past 2000. And I was stuck at 2000 for a very long time. But guess what? I was only talking about Twitter, Twitter, Twitter. What is it? What is it not? Who should we be talking to? And then one day, I left one of my clients who was having a problem about his confidence, about his mojo, about how he was such a um, CEO, top of his game, and how he was losing his confidence. And I remember talking to him about his confidence, and I remember saying something like, you know, 
Confidence is knowing you're able, but competence is knowing that you're able to take action. I don't even remember. It was something like that. And he goes, oh, another lollyism. And I said, what? He goes, yeah, every time you say something that's inspirational, I always want to remember it to my team and I call it a lollyism. And as I left, I was thinking, ah, oh, a lollyism. I must have a lot of those. And so I started to put those on Twitter, little quotes, things that I was sharing with my clients. And you can check this because Twitter keeps history of everything. I went from 2,000 to 10,000, like this. Wow. You might be asking yourself, what does that mean? That means what it, what it means, the definition is, I found that what, what was unique to me. I found how I could be different. I found something that I know what to talk about. This is my thing. And people started to respond. I found my audience. I found my tribe. I found people that liked what I had to say. And they still keep on liking it. So I stuck to it. I haven't even changed my formula from once I realized from 2000 to 10,000 works, it's a sure thing. I just keep doing it. And it's a system that I have used over and over again. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Tina, who's, who's on with us and is also a social media consultant, mentioned uh, just an interesting note. She says Twitter changed it to 5,000 last year, so the initial follow-to-follower ratio cap is higher now, just as an FYI for everybody. Uh, so thank you for that, Tina. Um, so Lori had a question. She wanted to know, uh, she said she's very interested to hear, Lolly, about how you landed on the methodology of the archetypes. How did, how did you come up with this framework? And that's a great question, so I'm happy that you asked that. So I have been coaching thousands and thousands of people, you know, individuals and yet in workshops. And what I started to notice was that there was a pattern that was being produced. It wasn't something that I was saying, oh, I see that, oh, I see that. No, it was people that kept mentioning the same things over and over again. And it sounds like this. Oh, I suffer from having self-doubt. Oh, sometimes when I'm really not in the greatest space, I actually manipulate my team. Oh, maybe sometimes I am a little bit corrupt because I'm cutting corners in what I'm supposed to do. And I started to take notes upon the virtues that I saw that was happening. And I saw the virtues that were working and I saw the virtues that were not. Adding the archetypes and the name of the archetype came later, but everything really started from the virtues of what I was seeing within people. And it didn't matter if it was a man, it didn't matter if it was a woman, it didn't matter if it was in Asia, it didn't matter if it was in New Zealand, it didn't matter if it was in Europe or in the United States. The truth that I found was happening across the world. Everybody was suffering from the same seven, you know, what I call gaps and the same virtues of greatness. And it was, I only, the only thing that I did was put it together in a system that took something that was very complicated and I made it simple. Mm, that's, that's awesome, I love it. So one of the things, Lolly, that, that knowing you, um, I just know is, is notable about you, is, is that you are somebody who produces a lot of content. You, uh, you blog very frequently, you tweet, obviously, a ton. Um, I'd, I'd appreciate it, and I think that the folks here uh, on the, the webinar would, as well, hearing a little bit more about how you do this, like what, what is your formula? How, how much content do you produce? And how are you able to do it so frequently and so prolifically? So I produce 100 articles a month. Um, <laughs> that's, that's even more insane than I thought it was, Lolly. Wow. <laughs> I didn't do it this month because I'm in my book launch, but it's 100 articles a month. And not, not all for Forbes, right? Or are they all, or, or sorry, not Forbes, Inc. Like, like, uh, Inc. I was doing two articles a day. Wow. Two a day. Oh my gosh. 30, okay. 30 day. Yes. And then I was doing my own blog and then I was doing guest posts. So yes, I was producing an enormous, I still am. I'm not doing it this month. That's the truth. <laughs> because I'm writing, because I am writing articles for different venues. So it's actually still 100 articles, but they're in, on different venues, like the Wall Street Journal, things that I haven't done before, and yeah. it's taking more effort. Sure. So how do I produce? Again, as I said earlier, I'm a very disciplined person, because if you're not a disciplined person and you don't have a system, you can't get as much done. I think, Dory, are you the same way? You, uh, well, I... I 
I, I think I'm pretty disciplined, but I definitely don't do a hundred articles a month. So, <laughs> so I'd love, I'd love to hear what you're doing. Yeah, but Dory can write something brilliant in 20 minutes, which will take me two hours. So let's, let's, so this is my system. My system is, is that I work during the week. I service my clients. I show up for my clients. I am there for my clients. And this is like face-to-face -face coaching engagements, you mean? Face-to-face -face coaching. So I travel or I do Skype or I'm on the phone. So there's really no time to work on what we would call my brand, right? My brand is writing articles and tweeting and networking and doing all those things that make you into a thought leader. My job is to make other, make other people, make other people, other people thought brand until I think it was like four or five years ago, someone said, you are a brand. And I was like, oh, okay, I need a tagline or something. But um, so how do I do it? I do it this way, is that once a month, I take the, the days from Friday to Sunday night, and I go to my Excel spreadsheet that has all those ideas of articles, and I choose and pick of something that has happened either to one of my clients, something that I've read in the news that's evergreen that people are excited about or talking about, and I sit and write as many articles that I can. It used to be that it took me four hours to write one article. I can write an article for Inc., don't tell them, in 45 minutes. I think Dory's much better. I think you could do things for Inc. like in 20 minutes or something, but now I can do it in 45 minutes and I just churn them out and churn them out and churn them out. Then what I do is the next weekend, so there's four weekends in a month, the next weekend, I then post tweets and articles that I have done in, Ho in Hootsuite, which I love, and there's other kinds of systems that you can use. And I post things on Hootsuite for the rest of the week. And I try to do a little like two weeks at a time. That gives me the freedom that during the week that I could go on Twitter in the morning or in the afternoon or sometimes in the evening and then respond to people that have spoken to me. So everything is automatic, but I then try to make it very personal every single day. So it's a combination of like preparing things in advance, but then it's also about being present with people in the present moment. So I kind of do a little bit of both. So my weekends, which are usually people are playing and jogging and running and doing, getting massages, I'm writing articles and making sure that I'm of service to my 1.2 million followers. Wow. So, wow. so you're... Um, uh, oh, there's kind oh, of a feedback kind of all of a sudden. I'm not sure why that is. Um, I... Not sure if something is going on here. Okay. okay. Anyway, it seems it seems all right now. Um, but yeah. So my my question, Lolly, is um, that thank you for explaining it and walking through it. So your weekends are kind of your time when you're jamming on it. Um, but the, I mean, if even if it takes you forty five minutes to do it, that means that you're working like like ten ten hour twelve hour days every weekend. Is that is that true? Is that really sort of how that breaks down? So the, the beginning of every month, I try to do as much as I can. And then I allow myself to breathe. And then there's four weekends. So I try to give myself enough time on the weekends that I, I love to read books. So I need to be able to read my books, get some fresh air, spend some time with my family. But the rest of the time is actually writing. I really enjoy one of the things you might not know about me, but I get enormous amount of pleasure of being of service to others and helping others. And so I think of my articles as little conversations I'm having with lots of people at one time. I might not be the most talkative person at your dinner table, but trust me, this is my way of how to connect. So it gives me a lot of energy to write those articles. So there are three weekends that I do spend writing articles, but not all day. Awesome. Thank you. So um, there was a question from one of our students that, that wanted to know, is each article unique or do you write it for one outlet and then sort of massage it or morph it for other outlets? No, everyone is unique. Wow. Very, very impressive. That's great. So we're winding down and I just want to put in one more call for people who are on the live webinar. If you have any last questions, go ahead and, uh, and type them in now. That would be great. And uh, Evelyn had another question. She chimed in. She wanted to know if you've, have you found uh, if people respond the best 
to the content that stems from those conversations that, that you've written down? Like if, there, if there's a particular pain point that someone has mentioned to you, do those seem to be the articles that really go viral or is there a correlation? Evelyn, again, a great question again. Absolutely. The ones that come from conversations are the, when I, when I can pinpoint a pain, those are my best. I, so one, of, one article that keeps doing well month after month on Inc. is something like, why are your best people leaving their work or something like that? And that came from a workshop. There was a group of people that were saying, I hate my job. And I said, you're so qualified. You can't leave. We need you. They said, I hate my job. And so that became an article on a plane when I was coming back. And it still does well because there's many people that hate their job. And so it resonates with people. If we can pinpoint the pain aspects in all our conversations that we have, and it doesn't have to be that you're actually facilitating workshops, but if you're talking to your girlfriend and she says, oh, I just lost my mojo, or I can't get it together, or I feel stuck, write those articles because there are thousands of people that feel the same way. Yeah, thank you. So, Lolly, my, my last question for you, because you are right in the thick of it now, as, as you mentioned to me, you have, uh, you have enough, um, you know, in your head for, for like a whole ebook about this. Uh, you're, you're doing the book launch process. Uh, you've been studying it carefully. If people who are watching this video are thinking of launching a book or about to, to come upon a book launch, what would your advice be? Is there anything that you've done that you would either particularly recommend or not recommend that they do in the book marketing process? So Dory is the perfect person. She's written how many books now? Uh, third one's coming out in the fall. Exactly. So I'm sure Dory knows a lot more than I am. I'm a virgin in this thing because this is my first big book. But I'll tell you something very interesting. It doesn't matter that I have 1.2 million followers. That's not going to sell my books. What sells my books is this, the connections that you have with individuals. Work on making connections. Work on keeping close to those that you know because you can't be out there and expect people to buy your book just because you have followers. The only way people will end up getting books from you are from the relationships that you have. And what's very interesting is, and I haven't said this out loud, but I will say it to you guys. So Dora, you're very special, but it, it is in my ebook. It's that I started out with a thousand people that I thought that would help me promote my book. Today I have 10. And, and I would say seven of them, I didn't know before I started writing this book. And so that is extremely important to understand. Even though you think people will help you, not necessarily that they will. And it's I'm just cutting in. When you say 10, you mean 10 people, not you have 10,000 people, correct? I have 10 people. <laughs> Got it. Yep, there, that's the ratios, man. Okay, sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I just wanted to clarify that point in case it was unclear to anyone. And it's the seven that I didn't even know three months ago. Hmm. There was one person that actually said, I read your book, I, I, I found myself in this book, I wanna help you, what can I do? And he showed up continuously over and over. He goes, I believe in you, I believe in you. I mean, I even had a call, and this is something else I did. I spoke to, I would say, 50 experts on what they did to launch their book and how to make it a bestseller. I took notes. I created a whole platform for myself of do this and don't do this, do the do's and the don'ts. And then I tried to implement it in the way I know how to do them. So number one is you might be, you, you will get people along the way that you've never known that will help you. And then learn from others what they do and try to make it your own. That's, that's fantastic. Super quick follow-up. One, one of our students wants to know, what, what was the profile of the 10 people? Was there anything they had in common or, you know, some, something that you sort of noticed post facto that like, oh yes, it makes sense. It was these 10. Those 10 were not on my thousand list. Let's be very clear. These are people that have read my book, resonated with the message and said, I want to help. I think they had heart. It wasn't that I approached them they approached me and it was it taught me a lot it taught me a lot it really taught me a lot 
Wow, Lolly, thank you so much for, for sharing all this. I'm getting, you know, really in the chat box, uh, positive, uh, positive feedback. People are, are really appreciating this, so thank you. If people want to get in touch with you, if they want to buy your book, if they would like to hear more from you, what is, what is the best way to do that? Buy my book. So pre-order my book right now at theleadershipgapbook.com and get a free assessment that most of my clients pay $97 for or you can find me at lollydaskell.com or on Twitter, lollydaskell. I think I'm the only lollydaskell that is out there. Find me, communicate with me because I love to connect with people. All right, awesome. Lolly, thank you so much. Thanks to, to all the recognized expert students uh, for joining us and, uh, and take care, everyone. Bye. Bye.